Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone, mm -hmm. and welcome to day two of the Asia Europe Sustainable Connectivity uh, Scientific Conference. My name is Diana Zahorte. I'm the Deputy Head of Mission mm -hmm. of the Romanian Embassy in Singapore. And it is my great, great pleasure to moderate today's session on people to people connectivity. Let me just say from the beginning, I am a firm believer that we should think and plan uh moving forward connectivity in terms of sustainability if we want our societies to prosper uh in day one of the conference we have heard many interesting perspectives on connectivity and on the way forward for sustainable connectivity between asia and europe i remember in particular that the direct the executive director of asap his excellency toru morikawa shared with us a picture of the IT staff uh, as a quintessential representation of what, uh, of what it means uh, to be connected. So I think it is only fitting that one of the first scientific sessions of ISCON is on people-to-people -people connectivity. Uh, at the end of the day, connectivity is created by people for people. Connectivity is uh, and connection with others is what makes us human. It's just that uh, as we evolved, our connections and our nets networks have grown wider and wider. Not to avoid the elephant in the room, the past nine months, which I'm sure all of us would like to have back if we could, have demonstrated how important people-to-people -people connectivity is to us, but also how vulnerable it is to disruptions. Now, there are countless ways in which we could uh, measure connectivity. If we look at the Asia-Europe Sustainable Connectivity Portal, there are eight indicators used there to measure people-to-people -people connectivity. In today's session, we will be looking at people-to-people -people connectivity through four precise lenses, which is cooperation in higher education, student mobility, remittances, and sustainable development goals. To do this, we have five terrific speakers who will be presenting four papers. First of to share with us will be Ms. Zane Shime uh, from the Latvian Political Science Association, who will be speaking about EU-India cooperation in higher education as an enabler of the ASEM sustainable connectivity. Zane specializes in European affairs. Her most recent research interests revolve around the EU science diplomacy towards southern neighborhood, the role of higher education and research cooperation in the EU-India relations and the Arctic, as well as multi-level governance of the Baltic Sea region. She's also a member of the Association of the Polar Early Career Scientists. Then we will turn to Mrs. Missy Octavia Manula and Ms. Juliana Prasetyawati, who together will talk about the implementation of people-to-people -people connecti connectivity through the Share Scholarship to strengthen Asian identity. Missy Octavia Manulang is an international relations graduate from LSPR Communication and Business Institute in Jakarta. In 2016, uh, through the LSPR International Academic Exchange, Missy was chosen as a student representative to EU Business School Munich in Germany. You, Juliana Prasetyawati is head of the undergraduate program in management at LSPR Communications and Business in Jakarta, currently pursuing her doctoral degree at the University of Indonesia. She's also head of the Center for ASEAN Public Relations Studies. Uh, and one of her most recent publications is the book titled ASEAN Travel Infographics, Facts and Recommendations, she has also published several articles, such as Higher Education in ASEAN Connectivity in the Asia-Pacific Studies Journal. We will then move on to Dr. Maria Angela Zafra, who will share with us her findings on the Filippo diaspora, a comparative analysis of overseas Filippo workers' remittances from ASEAN and EU. Dr. Maria Angela Zafra is the co-founder and executive director of Strategia Development Research Institute, a non-for-profit research organization focused on providing policy research, capacity building, and technical assistance in various social and economic development areas. She has completed projects 
and conducted capacity building programs for government agencies, international organizations, non-governmental organizations, and the private sector. Last but not least, Dr. Shruti Kulkarni from the Indian Institute of Science will talk about advancing sustainable connectivity through innovation, highlighting sustainable development goals number seven, nine, and 17. Dr. Shruti Kulkarni is an experienced researcher aimed to accelerate the advent of sustainable development goals by advancing the state of the art in machine learning and data science. She's finishing her PhD research at the Department of Management Studies at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. Her research developed insights into the context of corporate sustainability in India and provided analytical insights for business performances in the context of climate change risks and opportunities. A very quick layout of the session before I hand over to Zane. Each speaker or pair of speakers will have roughly 10 minutes to share their insights with us, followed by a very short Q&A session. And after all four presentations are finished, we will have an extended Q&A so that questions cannot, that cannot be answered immediately will receive an answer then. I believe by now you are all familiar that the questions should be asked in the chat section on the right side of your screen. Now, without any further ado, I give the floor to Zane Shime for her presentation on EU India cooperation in higher education as an enabler of arts and sustainable connectivity. Zane, you have the floor. Thank you, Diana. Um, I'll start sharing my screen. Uh, my apologies. Do you see my uh, presentation on uh, full screen mode right now? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Yes. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, once again, uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining this session. It is my utmost pleasure and honor um, uh, to present some of my findings um, uh, that I've come across over the last months uh, while doing uh, research on EU India cooperation in higher education and uh, focusing not solely on it in a bilateral manner, but also bringing in uh, to the perspective uh, the ASEM uh, dimension and especially people-to-people -people, uh, connectivity. Um, so briefly about the, the structure of my presentation, um, I will start uh, with uh, some conceptual considerations that have guided my uh, research work thus far. Then I will uh, jump uh, on uh, some empirical findings about the EU-India cooperation in higher education and research um, that you will find both in the abstract book as well as I have discussed some of these findings uh, in my submitted research paper. And then finally, um, I will uh, say a few words on why I think it might be interesting to explore further Riga as an ASEM educational uh, diplomacy hub. So, um, regarding the conceptual considerations, and a quick note on the visuals, uh, throughout my presentation you will see also some typical sceneries of uh, Riga and Latvia. Um, in case you haven't visited the country yet and you would like to uh, get some uh, glimpses of uh, the landscape and uh, the city, uh, cities of Latvia. Um, the more I read about um, Asia-Europe meeting, the more uh, I am convinced that it's a real treasure trove for diplomacy studies. I myself, um, as a graduate of KU Leuven, uh, of course, uh, have uh, found it very interesting uh, to study uh, certain dynamics of EU-India cooperation and uh, um, ASEM uh, cooperation uh, from the lens uh, of the EU structural diplomacy. But that is not uh, the only component that I've uh, found interesting in exploring. I've been also uh, touching upon people-to-people -people diplomacy science diplomacy and educational diplomacy. And here I would like to clarify that there are some findings that refer perhaps to education or educational diplomacy um, as a school um, level education. But my specific interest is related specifically um, to the higher education. 
And uh, the reason why uh, educational diplomacy uh, came to the fore in my research process was because um, of the Erasmus Plus program, um, its structure and its instruments that uh, in certain uh, in, um, components tend to combine both research and uh, teaching um, elements. And that makes this distinction uh, from where science ends and education begins uh, rather blurry. Then some of the major findings that I found um, interesting also uh, sharing with you today, uh, especially in the context of the uh, ASIM connectivity portal. Um, so the overall uh, trends that I found about the student exchange between EU and India um, tend to confirm uh, this overall uh, modest student exchange pattern that has been identified and also discussed in a wider context of Europe and Asia um, throughout the last decades. Uh, here are just uh, some two quotes uh, from uh, some of the landmark uh, documents that are oftentimes read by people who would like to explore uh, some of the underpinnings and structural components and key um, assumptions that guide Europe, Asia, uh, multilateral uh, interactions. Um, so here you can see, yes, an earlier uh, guidance uh, from the EU. And why I wanted to bring that into the spe uh, perspective is just to uh, underline that some of those trends that we can see in the ASEM uh, Sustainable Connectivity Portal although they reflect uh, trends from rather recent years, uh, they also captured some of the developments that have been there over a longer period of time. And then, of course, um, the ASEF uh, Public Diplomacy Handbook, it's, it's a manual that I guess many people among us uh, who are interested in people-to-people -people, um, connectivity uh, find uh, a rather exciting and, and very useful uh, reading material. Um, so why I would like to bring in all this discussion a specific um, a specific EU, Latvia and perhaps Riga focused um, uh, component is because on this, uh, bearing in mind this overall macro picture of rather modest uh, student flows between EU and India, when you look at certain country national uh, specific contexts, the situation is rather different. And the reason why I have put on this slide Riga as an ASM educational diplomacy hub and not the ASM educational diplomacy hub, because I fully uh, grasp the situation that these dynamics that are witnessed, for example, uh, by Riga as a capital of Latvia, um, are different from other contexts. And we have many vibrant um, awesome cities across uh, the geographical area that is um, uh, formed by the ASEM awesome partner countries. So this is just one of those micro um, cases um, that uh, should tell a rather promising story that uh, ASEM interaction is booming, it is really burgeoning and it's, and, it, and, and it's on the rise. The reason why I am giving such a uh, promising picture is uh, due to the international uh, student uh, flows that are coming uh, to Riga and Latvia um, uh, since I would like to bring into perspective not only the capital city, but also some of the other university uh, cities that are located in Latvia. Um, here you can see uh, that um, ASEM partner countries, students coming from ASEM partner countries form uh, some of uh, the uh, countries that uh, show the biggest influx of students uh, in Latvia. And India is definitely among those. What is more interesting is that 
when you go to the ASIM connectivity portal, you see the statistics from the academic year 2014-2015 uh, with 164 uh, students from India coming to Latvia. Uh, but what um, I've uh, witnessed uh, while perusing uh, some of the latest uh, policy uh, reports is that this uh, uh, takes only a slight element of these uh, dynamics um, it captures only a slight element of these dynamics because as you can see uh, from this graph over the previous academic years we've seen a really a remarkable and steep rise in uh, terms of Indian students coming to Latvia and just to put that into perspective I know that some of you are coming from uh, much more populous countries uh, but please bear in mind that um, uh, Latvia is a country of a population of uh, less than 2 million and that it also has a considerably small student population so that's why uh, these perhaps for other countries modest numbers should be put into that uh, context and, and, and also paying attention that um, the uh, overall uh, current numbers of Indian students uh, form more than one fifth of all the international students that are studying in Latvia. And um, one other thing that I would like to bear in mind um, is that um, the policy dialogue has been also present in Latvia. It's not just the students and the talent circulation that is shaping the way uh, perhaps ASEM and ASEM partner countries are interacting in the Latvia specific setting. It's also these high level uh, meetings such as uh, the ASEM MA5, uh, the meeting of education ministers, um, shape the way ASEM is um, perceived uh, within the specific geographical setting and the way uh, ASEM's intellectual influences echo during the uh, later years. So I think there's loads of interesting things that uh, should be put on the agenda for further research uh, to explore the ASEM education process in this specific context where there is so much of talent uh, present that are contributing to the overall goals of ASEM. And that leads me uh, to some of the major findings. Uh, first and foremost, that there are plenty of fascinating dynamics and multiple people-to-people -people encounters taking place far away from the discussion rooms of ASEM working groups, high-level meetings, and ASEM and ASEF labeled activities. Secondly, that encounters uh, online grow in importance as facilitators of meetings and consultations among individuals residing in ASEM partner countries and elsewhere and joint training events offer shared familiarity with certain concepts and terminology that spans uh, beyond uh, the ASEM agreed language. And I think also this conference is one of those great events where you can see that irrespective of uh, the perhaps geographical limitations, um, we're still meeting and having uh, great encounters and last but not least, uh, the ASEM Education Minister's meeting in Riga is a good example that the implicit spirit of ASEM lives uh, on and thanks to the circulation of talent. And further exploration of uh, how ASEM might benefit from this favourable intellectual environment would be one of the suggestions for the way forward. So thank you very much for your attention. In case you would like to uh, follow up on my presentation with further questions, please don't hesitate to contact me uh, here directly on Hopin. Uh, thank you so much, Zane, for your presentation. Uh, I think it was a, a very interesting uh, presentation to see the discrepancies sometimes between micro and macro trends even when looking at uh, the same uh, ASEM connectivity variable. Uh, if we have any questions for Zane uh, at this point, yes. Uh, you, one of the questions uh, from the audience is, the graph showed only number of foreigners. Do you have any reference or analysis that shows total students in Latvia? What do you comment on this intellectual moment? Thank you very, Thank you very much for this question. 
I, sh I should point out right now that I don't have in mind the actual numbers, uh, but of course those are um, captured by the same uh, reports that I usually um, use to find out um, the details about the exact country-specific um, student flows. So, sorry, right now I can't answer regarding the specific um, numbers of uh, Latvian students and international students, but if that question could be posted uh, directly on the chat um, so that I can get the particularities, I will be definitely interested in uh, following up on it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Zane. Uh, we have uh, uh, another question. One more question from Anna. Uh, any ideas how we could keep track, monitor all these people-to-people -people dynamics that are happening? That's a very good question. Um, I think the challenging part, as I've also uh, elaborated uh, in my submitted research paper, is that there are so many diverse institutions that are nowadays hosting um, online training events. Um, it's, it's a challenge. I think it's, it's really a methodological challenge and I don't have any quick answers right now. But I still find it important to stress that this component of intellectual encounters should be definitely um, kept in mind when thinking about how to uh, read and how to grasp the wider context of those uh, student flows that are depicted in the ASEM Sustainable Connectivity Portal. It gives a great macro picture about the basics. And of course, one short online training event that lasts for maybe approximately a week does not bear the same uh, weight and influence on the intellectual thinking and the encounters that a student um, has perhaps throughout a semester or even two or even several years if the student pursues, for example, a complete um, program of bachelor's or of master's uh, degree. However, I still think that these are very important means how to facilitate uh, greater discussions among students and should be appreciated as very valuable extracurricular activities that widen their horizons, that perhaps not only their own respective university is a great excellent center on certain topics, but there are several others that a specific student was not aware earlier, but you know, these online encounters help to map um, other um, relevant uh, centers that are worth uh, exploring in greater detail. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zanu, for this uh, excellent input. Uh, there, are, uh, I see more questions coming up, but at this point, we we, sh we have to move forward. Uh, we will now move to Missy, Octavia, and Juliana, who will share with us on the implementation of people-to-people -people connectivity through the shared scholarship to strengthen ASEAN identity. I believe this is uh, a timely presentation as uh, this coming Saturday here in Singapore, we have the first edition, the first digital edition of the study in Europe fair, uh, which uh, is open to all stu prospective students here in, in Singapore or the ASEAN region to look for study opportunities in, in 20 European countries. And there, there is also a webinar dedicated to, to the SHARE scholarship. Uh, those of you who might be interested, you can head out to check the website of the fair. It's called studyinyourope.com.sg. But for now, over to you, Missy, Octavia, and Juliana. You have the floor. Okay, I'm start uh, the presentation about the implementation people to people connectivity through share scholarship to strengthen ASEAN identity uh, by Missy Octaviana Manulang and Juliana Riana Prasetyawati from. Uh, LSPR Communication and Business Institute, uh, Jakarta, Indonesia. Okay, uh, the background of the, the research is about the connectivity is as a joint response against a global challenge. Connectivity is, is not just about the instructure. 
this, uh, there is something that uh, not less important, uh, namely the soft connectivity associated to with a uh, people, people to people context uh, in a connectivity. Uh, so this research especially capture the importance of the people to people connectivity through share program. Uh, share program is a uh, support to higher education in the ASEAN religion in its uh, cooperative project between ASEAN and the Dell partner uh, EU. ASEAN community uh, has a three pillar, uh, namely the ASEAN politic, political security uh, community and ASEAN economy uh, community and the ASEAN social culture community. And one of the objective uh, ASEAN social culture community is to build to ASEAN identity. Uh, so ASEAN needs uh, to strengthen uh, the we feeling as a call uh, ASEAN identity uh, through share a uh, program. Uh, this research uh, focus on the ASEAN social culture community uh, as the, the point uh, uh, this research uh, because uh, this pillar is open and dynamic uh, based on a people-centered uh, approach. Uh, share program uh, consists uh, have a three component. Uh, a, a policy dialogue, kemudian quality insurance and framework, and student mobility and credit transfer system. Uh, uh, the two uh, information about share program and the implementation uh, will be uh, explained with uh, MISI. Uh, but uh, the share program uh, has implemented uh, start to uh, 2015 uh, until 2019 and uh, funding uh, 10 million euro and uh, have a uh, 30 uh, ASEAN University in the same program like uh, uh, University in the Filipina and University of Management Cambodia, uh, Malaysia, uh, University Kebangsaan Malaysia and, and uh, uh, have uh, 40 uh, university students in ASEAN uh, include uh, uh, follow the program. And next. And the uh, research purpose is to the one of the implementation of the people-to-people -people connectivity to the same program uh, to build ASEAN identity. And the second uh, uh, purpose to can social contact with a local student uh, or community during the share exchange period can ask mechanism to explain uh, identity uh, pattern. Next, uh, Missy. Thank you, Mimana. Hello. So right now for the theoretical framework, starting from an individual level, willingness to communicate is the departure points of this research. It is a catalyst for the development of interpersonal relationship. In the context of stranger to stranger, the desire to communicate with outside group members offers the potential for meaningful development in interpersonal relationship. And predominantly, the desire to communicate is a behavioral manifestations of shared identity perceptions between the interlocutors. In chain concept, these perceptions of shared identity will encourage a greater willingness to communicate, which allows a positive experience in which led to an interpersonal relationship and which is the foundations of this research. In intercultural context, in interpersonal relationship, such as friendship. It's very central for intergroup relationship. In essence, the more positive information individual obtains about other social groups in their contact experiences, the more positive intergroup attitudes can be. And this has been supported empirically by various studies. In the theory of social identity 1979, Tachval and Turner stated, a sense of belongingness in one common group will reduce bias and intergroup, intergroup conflict. And this is what being highlighted in the common in-group identity model. This sense of belongingness known as shared in-group identity is the result of a cognitive shift from two different groups to one general group in perceiving others. Therefore, the common group identity has identified four types of categorizations in identifying the contact partners based, based on the identity segments that stands out. Therefore, individual can make adjustments by understanding others by shifting the reference focal points in the categorization. 
in the context of this research, intergroup are students who receive scholarship. We refer them awardees and with the people in the recipient countries. Students represent their country group, the ASEAN member states, while the society and the classmate recipients, the country's group. The methodology we use is a qualitative approach. This is an interpretism paradigm, a case study. Our unit analysis is individual, and we gather our data through semi-structured interview. In our research, here's are our findings. First is the ASEAN identity as a regional identity. Mrs. Nugroho, one of our key informants, defines ASEAN identity as the regional identity of the ASEAN community. It is a secondary identity after their country's identity. It also metaphorically described as one's personal recognitions of the world. An environment is only a broader environment and so on. It's um, taking it a step further and slightly wider than nationality. It is very essential, especially in regional cooperations. Bilateral diplomacy between member countries will be more robust, so as the people-to-people -people connectivity. ASEAN identity then will encourage the ASEAN community to understand each other better, which is very vital, especially towards the younger generations. Their ability to see themselves as part of the ASEAN vision, it will contribute positively to the future of ASEAN market forces. The next, is, the next is ASEAN identity as dual identity. Based on the result of our primary data interview, the second condition categorizations of the common in-group identity occurs within the awareness. The second condition is the existence of two subgroups in one group. Um, this is where one common group memberships from us plus them, it become we. Two subgroups within one group identifications are observed. For example, Temi Ramadan, from a student from Indonesia to Philippines, in his six months, he observed the many similarities that Indonesia and the Philippines had in terms of infrastructure, people's behavior, the problem we face. These similarities, along with the positive interpersonal contact, make Temi a more pro-ASEAN person. So when he was describing Indonesia and the Philippines, he used the form identification we. And therefore, Tami, Temi categorized himself as Indonesians and, and Philippines as sub-identities under the ASEAN identity. In a, similar in a similar manner, I'm sorry. Fernando in Vietnam, he lived in a dormitory with three other students from Laos. After returning to Indonesia, he began applying for jobs in ASEAN member countries. He then worked as a research associate at the World Face Myanmar. And the third is ASEAN identity as shared identity. In the recipient countries, a word is in their adjustments of daily lives, they were helped by nationals and be it the classmates, the citizens in general. Therefore, from this data, interactions through direct contact is encouraging the development of a collective identity. The social interactions between exchange students uh, from different nationalities, it will lead to a reduction in of the prejudice and then lead to the acceptance of one another. For our discussions, so ASEAN identity, in, this, the, in the results of this study, it indicates that the ASEAN identity is the regional identity of ASEAN community, a secondary identity, very essential for the people-to-people -people connectivity for the bilateral diplomacy to be more robust, encourage the ASEAN community to understand each other, very vital, especially for the younger generations, This because this will positively, positively contribute to the future of ASEAN market forces. Therefore, SHARE strengthen the ASEAN identity through mobility. SHARE scholarship uh, facilitates the awareness to obtain information through direct contact. This information becomes an essential component in developing interpersonal relationship. The establishment of interpersonal relationship between the awardees and their contact partners in the recipient country will generate a positive contact experience. And accordingly, the positive contact that is experienced later contribute positively in building the ASEAN identity which is the goal of shared scholarship. And previously, based on their motivation, uh, 
a world is where already aware of a shared in-group identity between them and the recipient country. Then share took it a step further and then the cognitive shift happened in themselves. The conclusion of this study is share plays a role in building or strengthening people-to-people -people connectivity. The awardees exploratory nature supports the awardees in acquiring more in-depth about the recipient country, subsequently builds the ASEAN identity. Educational diplomacy for share is a way for awardees to see, interact directly, to foster a sense of care towards the recipient country. Ergo, the ASEAN identity will grow within the awardees. And last, this study also supports the second conditions of common in-group identity categorization. In other words, it indicates the existence of a dual identity. This is the end of our presentations. Thank you very much for your kind attentions. Thank you so much, uh, Missy and Juliana for sharing us on how student mobility can contribute to this important ASEAN objective, which is strengthening ASEAN uh, identity. I think SHARE is just such a beautiful example uh, of how through universities and through students, uh, we can achieve uh, not just a higher uh, level of understanding between EU and ASEAN, but also a higher level of understanding within ASEAN, and I'm sure the same uh, would be available, would be uh, the case for, for the EU as well. Uh, let's see uh, if there are any questions for you at this point from the audience. In case. Thank you so much for uh, and uh, as usual, yeah? Because, uh, yeah. I agree with uh, you all that there is uh, excellent program to build the Asian identity and information and mm -hmm. uh, If there are no questions at this point, I, I will use my privilege as as moderator to ask, uh, do you think that the current uh, pandemic will have a significant long term effect on the on the share scholarship program? I'm sorry, Ian. Could you repeat? Uh, yeah, so I was asking you if uh, if you envision uh, any effects that the pandemic has had uh, on on the score on the sco share scholarship program or or in the future, you see any any impact? Okay. Uh, as of this moment, actually, this is still a four-year program, and it has ended in the 2019. Mm -hmm. And right now, it's still in the in interim conditions. Therefore, they are still deciding whether they're going to extend it for the next two years mm -hmm. with funding. However, right now, there still hasn't been any decision made. I see. Uh, there's uh, also a question uh, if you can share a little bit more on the methodology that you use uh, for this paper. How many interviews did you uh, conduct uh, for this uh, study? Uh, we will be a qualitative and uh, 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 informant. The informant is uh, H, 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 uh, percent. Uh, uh, Juliana, I think you would need to sit closer to the microphone so we can hear you clearer. So this is a qualitative research and we conducted the an in-depth interview for 45 minutes with eight key informants. Um, four, of the, four of them is an implementer of SHARE, three of them is awardees, and one of them is the chair of the ASEAN University Network in Indonesia. I see. Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Missy and Juliana, for, uh, for your presentation. We will now look into the issue of uh, overseas Filipo workers' remittances from ASEAN and EU as a connectivity indicator. Uh, Maria, please. Uh, Let me share my screen first. Yes, please share your screen. Are you able to see it? Okay. 
So, mabuhay and good afternoon. So, my name is Angie Zafra and I'm from the Philippines. And I'd like to present my paper on the Filipino diaspora, a comparative analysis of OFW remittances from ASEAN and the EU. So, this paper analyzes OFW activity within Asia and compares it to the activity within Europe. So, it includes implications for the Filipino workforce in light of significant geopolitical changes such as Brexit and ASEAN integration and the corresponding implications for the Philippine economy. So this study uses secondary data available from the ASEM, Sustainable Connectivity Portal, and is supplemented by data from other national databases, including the Survey for Overseas Filipino Workers, um, conducted by our National Statistics Authority. There are 10 million overseas Filipino workers, overseas Filipinos, meaning those that were born in the Philippines, but now are working or permanently living abroad. One subset of that is an overseas Filipino worker, which we normally call OFW, a person of Filipino origin who is temporarily living outside the Philippines as a migrant worker. So the key word there is temporary. There are currently 2.3 million OFWs as of 2018 against a total of 10 million overseas Filipinos. 96.2% of OFWs are working with a contract and 558 of that are female. So majority of OFWs are from the millennial generation, meaning from 25 to 39 uh, years old. Okay. In terms of OFW government oversight, because we are primarily a labor sending country, um, we have developed throughout the years a number of um, agencies and a number of policies that are geared towards ensuring the protection of our overseas workers. Okay, So these agencies work under the umbrella policy of the Migrant Workers and Overseas Filipino Act of 1995. And these agencies include the Department of Foreign Affairs as the primary agency responsible for foreign relations. But we also have specific agencies for migrant workers, such as POEA, OWA. And what's unique about OWA, it's funded actually by contributions from OFW. So they pay an annual contribution. We also have the CFO, which is under the office of the president, but their concern is all Filipinos overseas, whether you are a migrant worker or you are a permanent resident of another country. We also have uh, what another thing that's unique is the presence of what we call the POLO or the Philippine Overseas Labor Office in embassies abroad. So in countries that have a lot of OFWs, uh, Polo will be present within the embassy. So it's the operating arm of the Department of Labor in embassies abroad, whose primary mandate is the protection of worker, Filipino workers in those countries. So we have what we call a labor attache, who is the lead of the Polo. And then we have representatives from DFA, OWA, and maybe an interpreter. Um, as part of the staff of the Polo. But of course, it's still under the purview of the ambassador as the head of the mission. Okay. In terms of the Filipino diaspora, in a country of 105 million people, around 20% live below the poverty line. No? So that's around 20 million. OFWs work abroad to escape crushing poverty and unemployment and a lack of opportunities at home. They can be found all over the world with more than half of OFWs working in various jobs in the Middle East. East Asia account for 18.7% of OFWs, while 9% are working in neighboring Southeast Asian countries. Among ASEAN member states, many Filipinos are working in Singapore and Malaysia, primarily because they are labor receiving countries. Other ASEAN members like CMLV countries are also labor sending nations, which means that OFWs compete with citizens of these countries for jobs abroad. So we can see here the disparity between male and female OFWs in terms of the type of jobs that they hold. More than half of, Philippine, of female OFWs are working in what we call elementary occupations, such as domestic helpers, childcare, housekeeping in hotels, and lower-skilled factory working worker jobs. 
In contrast, male OFWs are mainly seamen, engineers, high, higher skilled plant operators, technicians, and trade workers. This means that male OFWs would have a higher earning capacity than the female OFWs. However, what's very noticeable is that only few OFWs from both genders reach managerial position. It's this, the red part at the very end. Only those people uh, hold managerial positions. OFW activity is part of the economic and financial cluster of the ASEM Connectivity Score, with personal remittances as the primary indicator. The figure shows that personal remittances are the strongest indicator for economic connectivity for the Philippines, while trade is actually the weakest. If W remittances has reached a record of 33.5 billion US dollars in 2019. Okay. In contrast, our trade deficit as a country was 34.6 billion dollars during the same period. So that's how large remittances are here in the Philippines. So OFW contribute to economic growth of the, both the Philippines as a country of origin and the countries where they work. So in terms of contribution to GDP, OFW remittances um, make up 11% of our GDP. In contrast, uh, business process outsourcing or the BPO industry, which is actually the largest industry that we have in the Philippines, contributes 9% of GDP. So that's 2% less than uh, remittances. So what you can see here in the graph is that personal and cash remittances have continually been on the rise. So they break record numbers each and every year. Executive order, which is by the president, 857 mandates every OFW to regularly remit a portion of his foreign exchange earnings to his beneficiary in the Philippines to ensure that the families um, of the Filipino worker is able uh, to meet their needs. So it's remitted to our banking system. So the mandatory remittances depends on your job. So it ranges from 50% for domestic workers and 80% for uh, seafaring jobs. So in this figure, we can compare remittance outflows and inflows from the Philippines. So you can see in terms of outflow, flowing outward from the Philippines, it's, the, it's China uh, that has the largest outflow, mainly through an Chinese working in enterprises such as offshore casinos, offshore gaming um, here in the country. In contrast, OFWs in Malaysia contribute the largest inflows uh, coming from Asia, while OFWs in Italy and UK send the most remittances from Europe. So in a largely domestically driven economy like the Philippines, so domestic consumption is our main driver. More remittances inflow means more domestic demand. And increasing domestic demand induces more economic expansion. So you can see here um, remittances from ASEAN countries towards the Philippines. So remittances from Mal Malaysia, which at 2 billion US dollars, is the largest contributor from ASEAN countries. So Singapore, which is second, only contributes less than 5% that of Malaysia. So ASEAN countries altogether contributes 2.2 billion US dollars in remittances, which is around 6% of total remittances uh, from overseas. <laughs> in terms of absolute numbers, when comparing uh, among ASEAN countries, the Philippines received the biggest remittances among ASEAN member states. Now, when you talk about absolute in terms of US dollars, that's the one on the right, the, the table, uh, the graph on the right. However, when we account for population size in terms of intensive remittances, the, that's, the, that's the graph on the left, the Philippines now declines to third given the country's 105 million population against the smaller size of Brunei's 43,000 citizens and Cambodia's 16, mil 16 million citizens. So the top 10 remittances from EU countries send $2.3 billion, which is comparable to the $2.2 billion sent by ASEAN countries. So it's roughly around the same amount. So remittances from Italy and the United Kingdom make up more than half of the inflow from EU, 
But these are still smaller compared to the top Asia-Pacific countries, especially when we talk about the Middle East. So the Middle East accounts for um, more than half of remittances. So here we can see side by side the comparative tables underscore the importance of OFW remittances to the Philippine economy. So you can see the stark contrast of remittance inflows and outflows from top countries in ASEAN and the EU. $2.2 billion flows in from ASEAN countries, while only $10 million flows out of the Philippines into um, Asia. There is a similar pattern in Europe with $2.3 billion flowing from the EU to the Philippines, while $81 million are sent from the Philippines to European countries. So in terms of implications of Brexit to OFW remittances, 33% um, of those who voted leave the EU considered control over immigration and its own borders to be the reason for leaving the EU. Okay. Uh, and then in terms of population, we have 78, 7.8% of OFWs are the ones working in Europe. So they are the ones who can be potentially affected by Brexit. Um, and then we consider that the remittances from the UK to the PH uh, to the Philippines is 650 million US dollars, which is second in Europe, but a fraction of the total 33 billion uh, remittance inflows. Okay. Uh, Brexit can probably have a minimal, minimal impact on OFWs as Filipinos were employed in essential parts of the workforce. In the UK, many of Filipinos are either seafarers or in the healthcare professions, which are, which are uh, very uh, essential jobs, especially the healthcare ones right now. So the prioritization of EU migrants might make housing and other social services more accessible to non-EU migrants. So mainly what, what's assumed is that the negative short-term effects mainly on currency are mainly caused by currency fluctuation of the pound Due to, um, due to Brexit controversies, but the need for skilled workers will trump over these concerns over the long term. Okay. In terms of the ASEAN integration into the ASEAN economic community, so the Philippines is actually the biggest net exporter of labor among ASEAN members. So most intra-ASEAN labor migration involves low and medium skilled uh, workers. You know? So with integration, there would be a better exchange of information and skills among ASEAN member states, including mutual recognition agreements for educational credentials. Although right now there are only, I think, around eight professions that have MRAs. But the, these allows more Filipinos, especially professional Filipinos with professional credentials, to have, to have freer movement around ASEAN member states. So the most positive development um, in ASEAN in terms of migrant workers is the signing of the ASEAN consensus on the protection and promotion of the rights of migrant workers. However, those two supranational geopolitical events are taking a backseat to what they're experiencing right now with COVID-19. So this is currently our, the crisis that we face. So you can see here the broken lines are OFW remittances when we started lockdowns, no? in-country lockdowns, local lockdowns, all different kinds of lockdowns to restrict movement in, of people um, to prevent the spread of the virus. So you can see how sharply it declined in terms of year-on-year -year percentage. So the steepest decline was in May when remittances declined by almost 20% compared to May 2019. Um, it's actually, um, it's actually uh, estimated that we will lose as much as 20% of remittances for this year compared to last year. So you can see a uh, first half of the year comparison. So you can really sh see. Um, so you can see the year-on-year -year performance of OFW remittances for January to June of each year. So by focusing on the first half of the year, we can compare the different effects of COVID-19 compared, um, compared to the first half of 2020. You can see here that while remittances are growing in terms of absolute US dollars, 
the growth rate has been slowing down throughout the years, but it's still growing. In contrast, as opposed to this year, the remittances for the first half of 2020 declined by 4% when compared to last year's figures, indicating that COVID-19 had a significant impact to OFWs. And why is that? Because around uh, more than 300,000 OFWs are, have, are affected uh, by COVID-19, either because their companies had to downsize and they were terminated from work, or they could not return to their jobs because uh, they were physically away from their jobs and could not go back because of the lockdowns. Um, and then the Philippine government um, ended up repatriating more than 170,000 OFWs, um, but others, even if they lost their jobs, preferred to remain abroad. Uh, maybe they were still hopeful that they would still be, continue to get jobs later on. You know? So these repatriation uh, are mainly from OFWs from the Middle East. You know? uh, and because of that, the government has allocated $1.5 billion for cash aid for OFWs, and an additional uh, $5 billion was approved last month to help uh, OFWs reintegrate back into Philippine society. And then, yeah, we, the government has also received uh, 400,000 applications for, from OFWs, whether they are repatriated or not, um, for assistance, cash assistance for their families, you know, because um, they, since they cannot leave their homes, they could not, send their remittances no they cannot send their salaries um, to their families so this this cash assistance is mainly just to make sure that their families have something to eat um, can make ends meet during this the lockdown period and part of the recovery plan uh, post-covid recovery plan of the government is to be able to provide livelihood programs to overseas filipino workers and in terms of contact trace tracers, which is needed, um, so the government identified that OFWs who are qualified will be priority hires. Um, but at the same time, this is not easy to do because we had a rapid increase in unemployment during the lockdown period. And uh, we have 4 million Filipinos who are local, living locally, who are also out of the job. So there would be a lot of people competing for jobs. In terms of OFWs... Maria, sorry, please interrupt you. You should uh, uh, try to wrap up as soon as possible. Yeah, you want it's actually... Uh, I'm on the last slide, actually. Um, so there's also a moratorium for healthcare workers. So uh, a lot of OFWs who are in the healthcare field cannot leave the country. So, in conclusion, if the Philippines and other ASEAN member states are to reap the benefits of labor mobility as an offshoot of the AAC, uh, we will need to manage all these different types of migration more effectively because we need to ensure um, the protection of migrant workers and not just uh, look at it from the economic side. You know? As a country, we need to balance uh, labor migration and also brain drain because we are losing a lot of skilled workers um, because they choose to work in another country. So the next task is really to keep up the momentum, how to maximize the development potentials of migration while continuing to look out for the well-being of migrants. So we need to put in place um, policies and structures, um, decentralize it from the national agencies to include it in local development planning as well. And lastly, uh, what COVID-19 has taught us is that we need to strengthen reintegration planning of OWs in the face of repatriation. Because in the events of disasters, there will be massive rep repatriation that will be needed. And if we're not prepared to reintegrate these OFWs back into um, the Philippine society, um, they, would have, they would struggle with you know, getting jobs and uh, living back here in the Philippines. So that's basically it. So thank you and good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Maria, for this very comprehensive and interesting presentation on uh, overseas Filipino workers' remittances.
uh, what has stood out in particular uh, for me from your presentation is the incredible impact that the pandemic has had on the statistical numbers, but also the complex policy responses that have been uh, implemented for uh, uh, the situation of the overseas Filipino workers in this COVID context. I was also not aware that there is uh, an obligation for overseas Filipino workers to, to remit back home a part of their income. That I think that was interesting. Uh, we have a question uh, from uh, the audience. Uh, are ASEAN migrant workers' rights projected under domestic law of each ASEAN country? Do these domestic laws uh, provide sufficient protection and prevention of human trafficking problems in the region? Okay. So, in, so in, the past, in the past, in the past, that was true. The in each country will have jurisdiction over the migrant workers. So if you send a Filipino to Malaysia or you send a Filipino to Singapore, he or she will uh, be governed by the domestic laws. But because they signed that ASEAN uh, consensus on the protection and promotion of rights of the migrant worker, we are uh, now moving towards that step no, of unification of policies across ASEAN in terms of protecting uh, migrant workers you know we've seen how how much migrant workers have been affected by incidences like covid for instance um uh, like you diana you're in singapore right so a lot of the covid cases there are the migrant workers living in dormitories right um so um with that consensus um uh, migrant workers have more protection uh, but it's still slowly getting there so they just signed the consensus. It's only been a year or two, I think. So the implementation, uh, it's still getting there. Uh, a follow-up question to this uh, regarding the ASEAN consensus. Someone is asking if it was ratified by all ASEAN member states. Yes, it was. It was ratified actually here in the Philippines when we were chair of ASEAN in 2017 because it was one of our primary agenda. So because we we have the most number of foreign workers, so it was something that we pushed during when we hosted the ASEAN summit and it was ratified uh, by all ASEAN leaders then. Thank, uh, thank you so much, uh, Maria, for your presentation and the answers to these questions. Uh, we will now move on to our last speaker. Uh, Shruti will share with us on the sustainable connectivity through innovation highlighting uh, Sustainable Development Goals 7, 9, and 17. Uh, Shruti, please, uh, please join us. Uh, the floor is yours when you are ready. So first of all, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to uh, present today on the topic of uh, advancing the sustainable connectivity to energy and innovation, highlighting the role of SDG 7, 9, and SDG 17. And first of all, I would like to thank the ACECON organizers for giving me the opportunity to uh, present today in front of me. So uh, moving forward with my presentation, I request all of you to maximize the uh, uh, presentation window uh, by double clicking on it so that you can see uh, my presentation. So, uh, United Nations have uh, developed 17 SDGs and 169 uh, targets to reach by 2030. And uh, uh, here we can see the 17 SDGs and out of which we are going to focus only on uh, SDG 7 that corresponds to affordable and clean energy SDG, and also SDG 9 that corresponds to industry, innovation and infrastructure. And uh, SDG 9 is to build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization and foster innovation. And finally, we will focus on SDG 17, which is about partnership for the goals. It is to strengthen the means of implementation of global partnership. So moving forward, uh, the research questions that I addressed here uh, was uh, three questions. Like which countries are leaders in terms of energy connectivity pillar? 
And uh, second question is SDG 9, which countries are leader in terms of innovation and connectivity pillar? And finally, about SDG 17, so we would like to find out which countries are collaborating for uh, sustainable connectivity, overall uh, physical connectivity, economic and financial connectivity, political connectivity, institutional connectivity, and people to people connectivity. So, data we used uh, for uh, my research is uh, all secondary data that were obtained from ASM Sustainable Connectivity Portal. And uh, for, for the purpose of this study, we use uh, intensive and miniaturized data because intensive data takes into consideration the denominators such as uh, GDP population and it scales the indicator to the country size so that we do not have any outliers uh, in our data. And uh, we, uh, for our current study, the methodology we used was principal component analysis and uh, came in, uh, in conjunction with claiming, came in clustering. And uh, so for the first question, I would like to present the results uh, for uh, which countries are leaders in terms of energy connectivity. So first we went uh, with the data exploration for that uh, what are the indicators in the ASM uh, data set. So we found out that in the first graph, we can see uh, the renewable energy consumption. And then what is the energy trade per country? Since the population continues to increase, we want to reduce the dependency on the, uh, on the fossil fuels. And we would like to see more uh, connectivity in terms of energy. So energy trade actually corresponds to how many imports and exports happen in terms of uh, electricity in Asian countries. And uh, we also see the share of renewable energy in consumption with respect to the primary uh, energy we use for GDP. And we can see uh, here the top energy consuming countries are Russian Federation, China, Mongolia, Korea, Tech Republic. And uh, so in, uh, in the right hand side, we can see the graph of CO2 emissions per capita. So if we see the darker the color, higher is the CO2 emission per capita of that country. So further, uh, I would like to explain what is principal component analysis. So we wanted to capture the underlying structure of the data and uh, wanted to find out the uh, uh, ex explore through exploratory analysis, what is the similarity between countries. So each country represents here a data point and we can see that there are two colors. So here uh, the orange color represents the European countries and Blue color represents the Asian countries. And further, uh, this, to understand this graph in details, we did a Cayman clustering in which uh, we uh, find out what are the uh, subgroups or what are the clusters uh, that we can find out uh, in, uh, in our data. So we can find out that uh, there are three clusters. There's blue cluster, uh, orange cluster, and uh, and a uh, green cluster so so it's how do we interpret these clusters is that in cluster one we can see that the countries which are closer to the measure which is trade in electricity such as slovenia switzerland malta or slovakia these are uh, countries which are champions in terms of trade in electricity so we can see that uh, the, these are the energy trade leaders and uh, countries which are closer to the CO2 emissions per capita are higher in terms of primary energy use are in cluster two. These are energy consumption leaders and countries are in green clusters. These are leaders in terms of energy renewable. So countries which have higher renewable and total energy consumption are uh, in this green cluster. And uh, so uh, the questions that we wanted to find out uh, that uh, for the second objective is which countries are leaders in terms of innovation connectivity pillar. So for this purpose, we used uh, indicators such as R&D expenditure versus patent file with a foreign co-inventor. Co so what does it mean that a patent with at least one foreign co-inventor filed under the patent cooperation treaty with at least one uh, co-inventor from the ASM country? And uh, research output uh, 
R and D output corresponds to the number of co-author publications uh, with uh, at least uh, one author from the Asian country. And we can see that uh, on, on on the left hand side, the R and D as the R and D expenditure increases in Asia, the number of uh, patent file with co uh, foreign co-inventor is not increasing. But uh, we can see in Europe that it is uniformly increasing. The higher the R&D expenditure, the higher is the uh, collaboration. So, uh, so we wanted to find out what uh, what countries what countries that are similar to each other and how what countries are different than each other. So we can see in this case uh, uh, the orange represents the Europe and uh, blue represents Asia. So these two clusters are distinct from each other and uh, the variables that we used uh, are uh, R&D expenditure, patent with foreign co-inventor and research output. So uh, countries which are closer to this uh, measures are uh, champions in terms of uh, the particular uh, dimension. and. Further, we found out through clustering uh, to get more insights into data, as in to predict uh, which countries are similar to each other. And we can see that we found out three clusters. And uh, to get more insight into these three clusters, we can see that uh, some countries are having uh, technical trade barriers. Some countries have better trade agreements. Some countries have high R&D expenditure. And there are some countries which are farther away from all these variables, which do not have uh, significant uh, data in terms of uh, uh, these measures. So we can see that uh, cluster one has low connection, uh, but high infrastructure, yet collaboration is not there. So countries which are opposite in terms of in cluster two, opposite in terms of collaboration as well as uh, low research output are in the orange cluster and countries which have high international collaboration, uh, high number of international students uh, in tertiary education as well as high infrastructure are, are in green clusters. Uh, so yeah, this, uh, so further moving on, I would present the results of SDG 17. For this, I use the aggregate intensive data for connectivity measures. So this uh, uh, measures are uh, additive uh, used by additive aggregating the uh, all the connectivity pillars. And uh, so in this uh, result, we can see again uh, a very distinctive uh, cluster of uh, Asia and Europe. And as we can see that there are some countries in Asia which are showed in orange color uh, and they are far from these uh, connectivity measures. So only in Asia, we can see Singapore and Brunei are closer to the connectivity pillars, but other countries are uh, further apart. Uh, countries in orange are further apart from the connectivity pillars. So uh, after, I mean, comparing the scores, uh, with the Cayman's clustering, we found out that there are three clusters of countries which are similar to each other. So uh, countries in green con green color are similar to each other, countries in blue are similar to each other, and countries in orange are similar to each other. And uh, to further interpret these clusters, we can say that uh, cluster three are leaders in terms of sustainable connectivity. And uh, since they have uh, shown more closeness to the economic uh, and financial connectivity and people to people connectivity and physical connectivity pillar and cluster one have shown more closeness to the institutional connectivity and political connectivity. Whereas uh, countries in cluster two have shown uh, less course in terms of overall sustainable connectivity pillar. So we can say that these countries uh, have shown sustainable disconnectivity. And uh, to uh, conclude more on that, we can see that uh, there are some details into the cluster we can see in this blue box plot, which says that, uh, so we can see that cluster one and cluster three are a bit similar to each other. 
as we can see uh, that uh, uh, the red box shows the physical connectivity and green box shows people to people connectivity so countries which are in cluster 3 show high scores in terms of people to people connectivity and physical connectivity and these countries are repre represented by each color and uh, in the stack diagram on the right hand side we can see which countries are in cluster 1 cluster 2 and cluster 3 uh, it's the same diagram that was in the previous slide but just a uh, different uh, uh, approach to show the graphs and uh, it is more uh, to the interpretation that uh, how we can define which country is ahead of each other or which country is behind. So we still have time till 2030 to reach this sustainable development goals. And uh, I hope we get uh, better data and uh, to explore more uh, insights into the ASM sustainable connectivity data set. So I would really like to thank and uh, make it open to the interpretation. And I will stop here with uh, 12 minutes. And I want to thank you. And feel free to connect with me uh, uh, in future. If you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Shruti, for your comprehensive uh, presentation and the extensive use that you made of the Asia Europe Sustainable Connectivity Portal uh you've gained you really made full use uh of what's there on on the portal uh and your findings are very uh comprehensive and uh hard rock data uh we'll see if there are any questions uh for you from the audience uh in waiting for for more uh, in waiting for questions from the audience, I would uh, use my, my privilege as a moderator to ask you first uh, a question. What would be your uh, suggestions uh, in terms of policies to strengthen even further uh, cooperation between Asia and Europe to reach the sustainable development goals? Okay. Uh, so okay. Uh, so my suggestions. To... Yes. Hello. Yeah. My suggestions to policymakers would be to uh, have more connectivity and look at the pillars and countries that are currently disconnected and uh, collaboratively how do you formulate uh, policies that uh, further increase the scores uh, in terms of um, in terms of people to people so each country has a different level of connectivity and thanks to the uh, data set that uh, we could see a rich uh, insights into data so more uh, more uh, efforts are needed from the policy side to uh, integrate this uh, into the uh, future policy so that each country will uh, uh, reach its targets by 2030. Yes, uh, I thank you very much, uh, Shruti, for your uh, answer. Uh, at this point, I would ask, uh, like to ask all the other speakers to uh, uh, to join us with their audio video. Uh, I open up the floor for any uh, questions that you have for, for our for our speakers in today's uh, session. So uh, I'm I'm looking at the questions that were asked so far, and uh, Zane immediately after your presentation, there was uh, one uh, question that we didn't answer is. Uh, in which languages can foreign students learn in Latvia? Um, English, of course. That's the only uh, foreign language with, or are there other languages uh, available except for Latvian, of course? I'm not perfectly sure I should check that uh, before I give a definite answer. So that's again. Uh, I would like to follow up after the session just to make sure that I'm giving an accurate information. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zane. Uh, Diana and uh, Nisi, uh, there was another question for, for you. Uh, 
uh, regarding what is the literacy rate in uh, ASEAN? Oh, okay. The literacy rate so far is 90% above, except for Cambodia, who is who's at 86%. I think and from Myanmar right now it's 75 percent however this is still data from 2016 there is not the most recent data yet I see thank you so much uh, Maria uh, I have uh, I have a question uh, for you uh, going through uh, through your pre presentation uh, you mentioned that uh, Malaysia makes for the largest uh, contribution of remit remittance in the ASEAN region, even though Singapore has a higher number of overseas Filipino workers. Uh, do you know what, what could be the possible explanation for, for this? Because uh, Malaysia has a lot of, let's say, um, engineers in like uh, petroleum, fossil fuels, so there's a lot of skilled workers um, from Malaysia, so that they send a lot of remittances. Um, in terms of Singapore, a large uh, Singapore OFWs are in domestic jobs, domestic mm -hmm. help in jobs. So that definitely uh, their salary is smaller. So the remittances are smaller as well. Yes, uh, that's a, a perfect the explanation that makes sense. Uh, uh, please, uh, to to our uh, audience, if you have any any further questions for our uh, speakers, we've seen very uh, different facets of uh, people to people connectivity during this session. If there are any any further questions. Uh, in any case, we uh, yes, we we have a question. Uh, this one would be directed to Shruti. Uh, can there be a study to find some policy prescription for integrating the ambi ambitions of ASEAN countries' targets in their NDCs uh, with the SDG pillars seven, nine, and seventeen? with the NDC target of such countries for 2030. I'm not sure if Shruti is uh, still with us to answer this question. I don't see her on the screen. Uh, sorry, I had to refresh my screen. Uh, yeah, I can answer. I think uh, uh, so. Uh, I think uh, so how uh, the integrating ambitions of Asian countries targets and in their national development councils, if I'm correct. So with the pillar of SDG 7, 9 and 17. Uh, so I'm not aware of all countries targets. So there has to be, uh, I mean, it has to be hierarchical that the state level target should meet the national level targets and national level targets should be coherent with the international targets. I think, uh, yeah, that so policy prescription will be uh, to increase the connectivity, not just in terms of international uh, uh, collaboration, but also in terms of uh, the national uh, targets. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much, uh, Shruti, for your uh, 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 feedback on this. Uh, we are reaching uh, the end of our session. Uh, I believe we all take valuable insights on the different facets of people-to-people uh, -people connectivity and also how they can contribute to the uh, advancement of the sustainability uh, agenda. Uh, I want to say a big thank you to our wonderful speakers and also to, to the audience for uh, posing uh, engaging questions. Uh, please do not go very far away. Immediately after this session, we will have a short uh, a short break for you to go grab uh, a cup of joe or, or tea and then uh, please do come back for a virtual coffee session so that we can continue this uh, discussion in a more uh, informal uh, setting 
to join the virtual coffee, uh, you will need to leave this session and head to the reception and then click on the virtual session. So see you in a bit. Uh, a big thank you again to our speakers and uh, thank you for your participation. Bye-bye. Thank you.